The second chapter in the X-Men Empire crossover miniseries eschews any Scarlet Witch-centric revelations from issue number one and instead concentrates on the all-out war on Genosha between the small group of X-Men, Katati plant aliens, mutant zombies, and... <sighs> horde culture. Today I'll answer, does this issue work, and is the Empire crossover worth your time as part of the Dawn of X reading? Plus, what secrets are revealed in this issue about magic, Ileana Rasputin, and some of the X-Men universe's worst villains that we have not seen before, to my knowledge, in the Krakoa era, Jonathan Hickman written era of X-Men. Some pretty exciting revelations tossed aside and some secrets that we'll get into. Hey, you're listening to Kraken Krakoa number 67. I'm Dave Busing, founder and editor-in-chief of ComicBookHerald.com. If you like the CBH YouTube channel or podcast, please consider liking, subscribing, and sharing. Spoilers for discussed comics may follow. All right. Empire X-Men number two. This episode of the X-Writers Jam Sesh is by Jerry Duggan, Ben Percy, Leigh Williams, and art by Lucas Wernick and Nolan Woodard with letters by Clayton Cowles. It picks right up where we left off in the Hickman written first issue with Horde Culture grabbing samples off the Kotati invaders and using a pheromone spray to make Angel and Multiple Man their puppets. Essentially, they are able to convince them that they are not the elderly uh, ladies, but they are young, younger and I guess more attractive to the likes of Angel and Multiple Man. The use of horde culture here introduced in X-Men number three really feels like a dead end gag that swings and whiffs throughout the issue. It, it, I think in many ways, you know, when we have these sort of older or middle aged writers writing teen heroes, you know, so like the champions very recently in the Marvel Universe is a good example. Um, a lot of times it can feel like it's this stilted dialogue that doesn't feel natural, right? It's it's a writing of an age or of a, a personality that doesn't feel like you necessarily know how to write that. Um, same thing applies here, I think, with horror culture. It feels like younger people, middle-aged people, desperately trying to write hip elderly ladies, and man, it just does not work for me. One of the very few upsides is manipulating Warren Worthington into horror culture's own personal himbo and getting him to croon Neil Diamond above the Genosian battlefield. The issue is largely all-out war between the forces, you know, everybody on the island at this point, with the Kotati unleashing their ace in the hole, which is essentially that they have this tentacled plant monster at the heart of Genosha that they're able to unleash and really begin to sort of solidify their presence. Now, as we learned in the previous issue, the existence of all these mutant zombies, of all the, you know, formerly deceased mutants that died on Genosha and Cassandra, no Cassandra Nova's attack in Ease for Extinction, the, the Grant Morrison issue, of new X-Men, um, they were brought back to life as zombies by Scarlet Witch's attempt at reconciliation, attempt at redemption, gone horribly, horribly wrong. So that is why there's a ton of zombies here, as well as the Katati invade as part of the Empire event, and they are invading Earth in an effort to literally wipe Earth out of existence. They are trying to get to the Wakandan Vibranium Mounts and then wipe out all plant and animal life in the galaxy. That's, that's the central thrust of Empire as a whole. So that's all this connects. Horde culture, they prevent backup back to Krakoa for Angel, Penance, and Magic, who are the X-Men and Multiple Man, uh, until finally Black Tom cracks through using the pollen in the air and turns into Wee Pollen Baby Black Tom, which is quickly up there with Amazing Baby and Jeff the Landshark for cutest new characters in Marvel. Uh, I definitely really enjoyed seeing Black Tom turn into this tiny little pollen baby, and he shows up and he is then able to connect back to Krakoa, which will ultimately, I think, help out the X-Men and, in fact, Horde cultures who they kind of need to ally themselves with. The central action is kind of a disappointing wreck. Um, again, like the horror culture insertion and dialogue is, again, just, I think, a big swing and a whiff. Um, there are a few big reveals that really caught my attention. The first is Ileana Magic really takes center stage here, and her connection to Limbo is very, very firmly established. They need help, right? They can't get to their Krakoan alleys right away. So what does she do? She reaches out to Limbo and all of the demons that she controls and six them essentially on the plants and the zombies. I think this is a thing that has been fairly uncertain for me throughout the Krakoa era, given Ileana uh, Rasputin's you know, recent history. I, how much of a connection does she have? Is she still the ruler of Limbo? Do the demons respond to her, right? All of these things that I, I was generally unclear about. You know, plus, too, we have to consider with Krakoa, could resurrection, could resurrection protocols free Ileana? 
from these ties to limbo? That seems like a big question. I wonder how appealing it would be to her. Because not only does she remain connected, but she's also able to transform into her full Dark Child armor as she assumes the position of the X-Men's War Captain. You know, so she is going full Dark Child, full control of demons here. This is a fairly big revelation. I don't think this is something that has been confirmed in X-Men. I think, I, I don't know that she ha definitely has the Soul Sword, but this makes it seem like she must, um, which I think could be something that could interestingly play into Ten of Swords, which is on the on the horizon. Plus, we haven't really gotten to see a ton from the Krakoa era team's captains in actions, even though they were designated alongside the Quiet Council. You know, X-Men number four with Gorgon and Cyclops kind of notwithstanding. So good to see Ileana as the X-Men's war captain really taking charge. And she calls for the presence and all available psychics to come and help the team, uh, you know, quell this uprising, this, this war on Genosha. This is the biggest reveal. It's practically a throwaway detail in the issue's final page, but we get in this image Shadow King and Mastermind appearing alongside the psychics. This is a huge deal, right? To me, at least. These X-Men villains have extraordinarily extraordinarily bad histories with you know the the x-men franchise it's a very big deal to see them showing up in this splash page i've talked before about shadow king being you know kind of the arch nemesis of professor x right this this extreme villainous uh you know mutant if he's living on Krakoa, that's a huge thing we have not seen referenced before so to see amal farouk show up here you know gleefully coming to war i want to know a lot more about what it's like with him on Krakoa and how that works and how, you know, it, Professor X leading the the whole, you know, Krakoa nation. It, it The generosity, sort of the amnesty of Krakoa extending to Shadow King, I have to say, even though it was an all mutants in quotes thing, I thought there'd still be exceptions. Mastermind again, too, like with all of his manipulations of Jean Grey through time in like the Dark Phoenix saga, you know, that is a huge, huge bad history as well. So despite very middling feelings about this issue overall, I'm extremely excited for this cabal of psychics entering the fray, particularly again, given that we've seen nearly nothing of Mastermind and Shadow King. You know, that is a that is an interesting unit. And again, I'm not even talking here about the presence of Exodus, Mr. Sinister, Lady Mastermind, um, the five and one, right? All these other cool characters that are there at Quinn Choir, of course, uh, who will almost certainly get killed because he just is he can't seem to can't seem to avoid it in the pages of x-force so this issue again like i don't think it was fantastic but it does continue what has been a very interesting mini series i think it's very essential to enjoying the dawn of x given the revelations of scarlet witch in empire x-men number one and now given these again casual revelations of Shadow King's presence on Krakoa, of Magic's connections to Limbo, and the fact that she is still very much capable of Dark Child armor. It's very interesting. Uh, so next time, the Krakoan teases that Empire X-Men number three will be a psychic showdown, which, again, I'm super excited about. I do have to call out, the Krakoan is spelled out in, in English text, and I, for one, am not having it. Keep that in Krakoan. Let us translate. I've got my little uh, cue card right here. It is probably the most used item on my desk. Don't give that away. Come on. <laughs> I understand it for marketing purposes, you know, that you'd want to uh, entice, you know, more readers to continue reading. But let let the true Krakoans translate on their own, right? All right. Thanks, everybody, on, on Patreon.com slash Comic Herald for supporting Comic Book Herald endeavors such as this here video. And thanks to everybody who checks out all my content. Again, I'm Dave. You can find all my writing at ComicBookHerald.com. You can find me at Comic Book Herald online. And uh, look for the best comics ever and my Marvel This Year podcast for podcasting. And again, like if you like the YouTube channel, please comment on your thoughts. I'm curious, thoughts, theories, ideas. I get some great, great feedback from all of you. So I super enjoy that. Uh, definitely let me know what you all think here in the comments. And again, if you like the YouTube channel, please like and subscribe. It helps me a lot in terms of uh, motivating me, for one, and also just continuing to reach new people, which is, uh, which is quite useful and nice. So thanks, everybody, for listening. And as always, enjoy the comics.